afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. It's a real privilege to spend this uh, bit of time with you and talk to you about the National Development Plan and uh, what we're saying, what we're achieving, what, and uh, what my experience has been there. You know, often when, you, when we come to a week like this and we think about Madiba and what he did for the country, uh, one of the bigger questions at the Planning Commission right from the onset that we had to ask was, uh, why is South Africa a nation? What are we all doing here? And what makes us special compared to any other nation anywhere else in the world? Now that kind of question I had to uh, contend with with uh, some of my fellow commissioners. I thought I'd put up a picture uh, that shows you, if you can just maybe scroll uh, down there. Some of my fellow commissioners are, and you know Minister Trevor Manuel, and my, my talk today is going to give you a little bit of an entree into what he'll probably say when he addresses us next week. And uh, see this as an opportunity to get some tips on what questions you could ask him, so you don't have to ask me the tough questions today. The uh, Cyril Ramaphosa is our Deputy uh, Chair of the Commission, our Deputy uh, Commissioner. And he's an esteemed person himself who's written or chaired the writing of the Constitution. And some of the other people there, um, Malusi Balantulo is a former Vice Chancellor. Uh, Hussein Kuvadia is at the University of KwaZulu Natal. Anton Eberhard is at UCT. Uh, we have uh, Bobby Gotzel. Bobby was many times top chief executive in the country, Anglo, and so on. Uh, Philip Harrison is from University, uh, uh, from Wits University. You know that, the guy next to him. Then there's uh, Malikapuru Mahoba, Vice Chancellor of uh, UKZN. Uh, we have uh, at the bottom, sorry, let, let's go to Elias Masilela, who is the Chief Executive of the Pu Public Investment Corporation, uh, who manages the most pension funds in the country. Uh, he manages, whew, Billions worth, 26 billion, I think, is what he manages. Uh, then you have at the bottom here, um, Aaron Rinsberg, Vice Chancellor of University of uh, Johannesburg. And you have Carl von Holt from University of uh, Johannes, uh, from Wits University. So you, you have a combination of all kinds of very bright people uh, who's got to think about what the future is like. And the first question is, why is this a country? Why was it worth rescuing? And why did Madiba, in particular, uh, spend his life and his life's work uh, to save this country? Does anyone have a quick answer for me before I give you my answer to that question? Why is South Africa a country? Zimbabwe, Switzerland, or Iceland, for that matter. What makes South Africa significant in the world? <clears throat> I'm not getting any hands, so I'll venture my own response. I think it's an important question that we must ask ourselves, that we must ask of our history, and that we must ask of our future. My belief is, that anywhere in the world where you have a confluence of nature, you are likely to have a confluence of people. In South Africa, we have a confluence of two great oceans, the two biggest oceans that meets not very far from here. And like the confluence of two great oceans, similarly the confluence of the largest combination of ecotypes ecosystems anywhere in the world you find in South Africa. You find <clears throat> four seasons, where in many other countries you find two or three seasons. So you have this mixed spot of everything on the tip of this great continent where civilization started. Started at the northern part of the continent and it ends at the southern part. And there, of course there are some people who say no, it actually started in the southern part. 
Now, this confluence of nature also means a confluence of people of different types and different ethnicities and different races and different ideologies, all in this melting pot, as if someone intended to test humanity's resolve. In fact, to test humanity at this tip of this continent. I believe that is why we exist as a country. We God's experiment about his creation. Not only nature, but also people. Now, we can't pray to have a country that's right. right. Because if we all sit down and pray, the corruption won't go away. So it needs human agency. So he introduces human agents at the tip of Africa to change this place for the better, to prove that his human experiment is a worthwhile experiment. And <clears throat> chief, the chief scientist in the laboratory is called Nelson Mandela, who says, let's make this thing work. Because if we fail, we don't fail on our own accord. We fail creation. We fail our existence on this planet. Now, it's probably getting too heavy for a one o'clock speech. Be that as it may, if I can just go to the file, the PowerPoint. We sat together and said, what should South Africa be like in 2030? The president called us all to the union buildings about two and a half years ago, and he said to us, your job, you're not representing government. You're not politicians. You don't abide to government. You are representative of the people of South Africa. I've selected you guys. You're the brightest minds. Go and take a critical cross-cutting view of this country and tell us what future should we charge at. That's what he gave us. So he gave us free reigns. We can say anything. We can even say we don't like the president. We don't say that, but we, we sometimes get close to it. Be that as it may. We sat down and said, the first thing you've got to do is sit down like a, a GP and say what's wrong with the patient. And we identified nine problems with this country. And we brought, up, brought out a diagnostic report that listed these nine challenges that our country faces. And it's always important to go back to what's wrong. The first thing that's wrong with our country is that too few people work. You can carry on a bit. Next one. Yeah. The first thing is that's wrong is too few people work. The second thing is that the quality of education school education in particular, for black learners in particular, is poor. You know, you can't have a country where effectively 30, only 30% 30 of pupils pass matric, if you want to use mathematics as the proxy for that. You, you, you don't have a future if you don't have a school system that actually doesn't work. Our infrastructure is inadequate. We've not invested sufficiently in infrastructure compared to earlier years. In fact, we invested more in infrastructure in the apartheid days than we invest now. Our latest biggest investment have been in, in uh, uh, soccer stadiums. Does that really enhance the economy? So we've, we've lagged on our infrastructure. Our spatial patterns still represents the past. White folks live where white folks live, and black folks live where black folks live, and rich folks live where they live, and poor folk live where they live. And there's a little bit of overflow, but the overflow is determined by your ability to pay, not by your citizenship and by your humanity. In fact, it's worse that the poorest people live furthest from the economic opportunities, and it should be the opposite. In many other countries, the poorest people live closest to the opportunities, to where the industries are, to where the central business districts are. So the spatial patterns still represent the apartheid uh, planning. Our development path in terms of our resource use, sustainable development, is unsustainable. You know, we don't have enough coal to feed all the energy needs of our country. Similarly, with, uh, with fuel, and similarly with most other non-renewable resources, we, we actually consume more than we have. So at some stage, it will run into a deficit, and it's getting there very soon, and our electricity is one 
our energy consumption is one area of grave concern, and that includes water. The public services is uneven. Some public departments work, and some don't work. And those who don't work are abysmal. No wonder we're seeing this uh, resurgence of uh, activism amongst civil society. You say we don't accept this quality of service from municipalities. Corruption levels are high. Now, we, we don't say reduce corruption. We say eliminate it. We, we, we've become a country where it is OK to be corrupt. And it's OK for some to, be, to enrich themselves as tenderpreneurs on the basis of political affiliations and connections and all forms of nepotism. And this country has become more corrupt. And it's not only government corruption. The corruption in the private sector is as bad, if not even worse. If you look at BE, for instance, many companies would uh, simply appoint black people to the directors of their companies, irrespective of whether these people are actually able to function at that level. So they make them puppets. So corruption levels throughout society become too high. In fact, we've created a society of people whose, who exists, whose entire existence is about how much can I grab how quickly. Let me not mention names. <laughs> and some of them go to jail, and some of them come out of jail. And some of them, <laughs> that was a joke. <laughs> Okay, so, and, but our biggest problem, our biggest problem, and this is where we have failed Madiba, in that <coughs> since 1994, we've not become a closer society, a more cohesive society. In fact, we've become more polarized. All that has happened in, in, in South Africa is that we've organized ourselves a little bit away from race, more towards class, but it's a dual thing. It's about race and class. So black folks who do better move into the upper classes, but the, the, the bottom strata of society remains largely poor and largely black and remains divided. And we've become more uh, divided over time. Of course, that only depends on whether you win or lose the next cricket or next rugby match. Okay. So we said that's what the country looks like. Let's now quickly look at what the world looks like. I won't spend much time on this. You, you guys know a, a lot of that we're saying. That there are six factors that determines how competitive you can be and how successful you'll be as a nation in the world. You've got to take cognizance of this. So the first is what we call the West to East tilt. You know, in 1994, China was not a factor in the world economy. And 1994 was just the other day. You know? <clears throat> I'd already completed my studies by then. But it was just the other day when we didn't even talk about China. In fact, when we did talk about China, it was about the crap toys and uh, <laughs> petty commodities that they, that they manufactured. Suddenly, in less than 20 years, China becomes a big, a massive factor to determine where the world goes. It is the biggest consumer. It is the biggest lender of money. In fact, I saw a little article the other day. They say one of the people who's going to have the biggest impact in the world. You know, they bring out these things, and they, and, and they uh, mention these, these people. One of the people is a guy at some US university who writes about what are the chances that the next world war will be between America and China? Because all that happens is China borrows America their money, and America's ability to repay is re being reduced from one year to the next. And how do you get your, if you borrow the guy your money and he can't pay it back, what do you do? You go for his kneecaps. So that's um, a not too far-fetched idea. So you have this massive east to west um, or west to east tilt. The, the east is where the money is. People will start learning Mandarin and so on. The second one is interconnectivity. That you guys know. We use that by putting a Maasai Mara uh, with a cell phone in hand. So it's a globalized world. We, we're facing terrible, terrible consequences of climate change. We haven't seen the worst yet. If you look at South Africa, the last time we had a serious earthquake was 1968. 
67, 68, the Talbach earthquake. That was the biggest one we had, right? That is not a big earthquake by world standards. Now, I can't remember what a big earthquake on the Richter scale is, maybe six or seven. You can help me there. But they say that the last time that South Africa had a, a, a big earthquake by global standards was a thousand years ago. And they more or less come once every thousand years. So that means we're in for some trouble. And because the globe, the planet, has become so destabilized over the last hundred years especially, we, we are going to face uh, natural disasters. Currently, I'm, I'm, I'm an agricultural scientist, so I, I, I talk in agricultural terms. Currently, we have a massive drought in the USA right, that will affect food prices and grain prices over the next six months. You can watch every night on TV, you watch the what is the current price and what is the milli price. Just watch it over the next three months. You'll see how that price just increases and increases. And food will become more and more expensive. And the poor will become, uh, how do you say, discerned, if not disturbed. These, these protests that you see in townships about non-service delivery has less to do with service delivery than you think. It has got more to do with people's inability to feed themselves. In South Africa, only 56% of people are able to feed themselves with adequate nutritional intake. The rest of people don't take in enough energy to sustain their human bodies. So <clears throat> there's a problem looming. Climate change is happening. The world is becoming warmer. The sea level is rising. Da, 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 da. Don't, don't uh, get too worried yet. But by the time you guys are going to work, and by the time you're going to have kids, and by the time you come to your mid-career, the world will be a different place from a climate and natural point of view. There's a technology factor. The last thing I could mention is this resurgence of Africa. Africa is becoming a more and more important player in the world. The only problem is that people see Africa as a place to strip of its resources, to strip of its people, of its talent. And it still seems to be the case. In South Africa, another big factor that's playing a role, and this has nothing to do with Julius Malema, it's simply the fact that we are entering a so-called population window. For the first time, people under the age of 18 are less than 30% of the population, not more, less than 30% of the population. And for the first time, people who are over 60 are less than 7% of the population, right? So those people are actually people outside of the economy. The rest of the people are inside the economy. What we're actually saying is we are experiencing a, a, a population composition where the productive part of the economy of people are not growing, it's getting smaller. And what worsens it, that fewer and fewer of them, especially the youth, are able to find jobs. That is not a South African problem. That is a global problem. It's the same in Brazil, it's the same in the States, same in Europe, it's the same here. Okay, let's carry on a bit. So, what we're saying in the National Development Plan is that there are six important things that the country must get right for a future. Go through them quickly. The first thing is we have to unite the country, all our peoples. Otherwise, this experiment at the tip of Africa will not work. Secondly, we cannot say that this depends on what the president does. There's a focus these days on the president. From, from everything that is overt about him and everything that's covert about him. Now, that's not entirely fair, right? Because people get the leaders they deserve and leaders get the people they deserve, right? So the leader we have is the leader we deserve. Now, you can have a go at him for various things. doesn't matter. The fact of the matter is leadership does not come from the top politician in the country. Leadership comes from everybody taking responsibility for themselves. And our country has lost that. In fact, this is one area where we can criticize Madiba. He did too much for us. He sacrificed 27 years of his life. He should have dished out 
one year to 27 people and not sacrifice it all by himself. He shouldn't have spent his entire life give to this country because now we all sit and say we're reaping the benefits of something that he negotiated for us. We didn't really partake sufficiently to make sure that the, our development is in our own hands. And I think that is the challenge that he's put to us. We've got to raise economic growth of this country. We are growing around 2%. We should be growing at about 4% uh, given our capacity. And we should actually try and grow at 8% if we want to be a winning nation. We're not nearly close to those growth, growth rates. We have to focus on capabilities. And let me stand here a little bit. There is a, there's a Nobel Prize economist, as far as I know, the second black man or non-white man to win the Nobel Prize in economics, Amartya Sen, uh, who said that if you want to develop human capability, he calls it the human development approach, to develop, you have to de invest in human capabilities. And when people have capabilities, they'll take advantage of opportunities. Because there's no shortage of opportunities. There's only a shortage of capabilities. And we haven't sufficiently invested in capabilities. So this entire plan hangs around the central concept that says, if South Africa wants, wants to have a future, it lies in what we invest in the capabilities of our people and our institutions so we can take advantage of opportunities. At some stage, someone invested in the capabilities of Pakistani cell phone sellers and manufacturers. Now you find them all over our streets. You, you need your cell phone fixed, you know where you go. At some stage, someone invested in Chinese families in their trading behavior. So today, you find them in every little town. There's some Chinese guy, his little wife, their little baby, and they have a shop and they make a living selling Chinese stuff to us. We haven't invested the capabilities in people to go offshore. Those who go offshore, those investments were made during the apartheid days, not after apartheid. So we need a resurgence of investment in capabilities so this country can take advantage of the opportunities that are before us. And that includes developing a capable state. We have a state machinery that is abysmal. It doesn't work. And lastly, we need strong leadership. Leadership throughout society. It's not about the president. It's about each one of us and the situational leadership that we, that we show. We use this graphic to, uh, to show that we say the country will be built on three elements. Strong leadership, effective government, and an active citizenry. Through that, we'll have the conditions We'll create the conditions which will bring about opportunities through the capabilities of people, and that will lead to employment growth, poverty reduction, and raise the living standards of a country. And that is the so-called virtuous cycle of development. Now, I probably have five minutes left. I'll run through this a bit quicker. We've, we've set certain targets in the plan. Amongst uh, the economic targets, we've got to increase employment. We've got to raise incomes for 50,000 a year to 120,000 a year. This is now averages that we're talking about. We've got to increase the quality of education at school level and it's pre and preschool education. So kids can actually read and write. You would be surprised about how many kids, once they get to grade four and five, can still not read and write or do any arithmetic numeracy. <clears throat> So there are many of those things that we've got to do. Then there are other key targets uh, in terms of uh, people's access to, to social amenities. We've got to have clean running water. We've got to have high-speed high, uh, broadband internet available to most people. We've got to be a country that is food secure, have a, a solid social security system, you know, social security. When President Mandela was president, he put 4 million people on social security, on social grants. When President Mbeki became president, he made it 8 million people. In other words, he bought another 4 million votes. When President Zuma became president, he increased it from 8 million people to 15 million people. So each president has doubled, more or less, the amount of people on social grants. In fact, today we could comfortably say that one in three, if not one in four, 
one in four, if not one in three people in this country are on social grants. That's not a country that can look after itself. Right? Okay, we can carry on. I'm trying to get you to more to sections that would be of more interest to you. Let me move on a little bit. Let's just talk about education and skills. Now, in education, especially secondary education, primary and secondary education, but the same holds for tertiary, we need a clear accountability chain where we can hold schools and school principals and governing body responsible for the performance of those schools. It is clear a school that performs better has a simple formula, good principal, good school, bad principal, bad school, good governing body, good school, bad governing body, bad school. So we're saying that the state must contract each principal and his governing body on certain defined predetermined targets. If they don't reach that, we'll penalize them. If they reach it, we can reward them. We have to expand preschool education because there's no doubt that because some people grow up poor, they always will have a disadvantage by the time they go to grade one. And part of fixing that is giving them one, if not two years, prior to going to grade one. Because that's where you can feed them and you can educate them and better prepare them for school. Everybody knows that in education, the earlier you make the impression on the child, the better the performance later. So saying at least two years of preschool education must be put in place, accompanied with a nutritional program. We're also arguing for massive expansion of further education and training, in other words, for colleges and not for universities necessarily. It's the further educational and training level, the, the real artisanal and vocational skills level where people like, everybody who's been to university now, the day you get your degree, you're not sure you can actually do the job. You know you can think, but you don't know how you're actually going to do your job. Countries who are, who are successful, Germany is probably the best example of that. If you go to Germany, you'll see this massive programs of artisanal skills and apprenticeships and learnerships um, and, and technical colleges that trains people to be able to do the job. We made this mistake many years ago when we went for this so-called outcomes-based education without fully understanding what it is that we were talking about. I'm not going to repeat some of the things I've said about spatial development, Maybe a word on the rural economy. Can you just go one back? 50% of people live in rural areas. But of the people living in rural areas, 70% of them live there and subsist of social wages, of social grants. The other 30% doesn't get anything. So there's no rural economy other than commercial farmers who farm and employ people and they are the elite of the rural areas. That's not a sustainable model. You can't have that. You've got to get the rural areas going, and you've got, pe got to have people living in rural areas who are able to make a living from agriculture and from agricultural-related activities. So we wrote a plan that says agriculture is going to create a million jobs in the rural areas of South Africa. It used to, it used to have two million people in, in jobs. Currently, agriculture employs 600,000 people. And in the last 20 years, we've lost a million people out of agriculture. So we say we've got to rec recuperate that and advance agriculture through irrigation, expansion, through getting the homelands into productive um, activities and to uh, changing the land ownership patterns by having a better, improved, and more effective land reform program. I've said what I wanted to say about social protection and corruption. I think I must end off by talking about our key challenge of social cohesion. It is necessary for all of us thus to transform this country, its economy, and its people. And you can't start by saying, how many people do you want to employ and what your growth rate is going to be. It, it will start by doing what Madiba did. 
you first inspire the nation. If you inspire people, they will set the goals that they want to achieve for themselves. So we believe that national building, social cohesion, is the most important part upon which uh, our future will be built. That part, I must add, lies in your hands, who are going to command that future. I think I'll be there too. Thanks so much.